the mind hack. The human body is version 1.0. It's a magnificent, messy, jury-rigged piece of biological hardware that evolved to do one thing, survive long enough to replicate. It was not designed to run advanced calculus, trade stocks 24-7, or remember the quarterly reports for a regional sales meeting. Our brains, in particular, are running on ancient code. They crave sugar, salt, and fat. They prioritize immediate threats over long-term planning, and they get tired. In our relentless, optimized, productivity-obsessed world, this buggy software is a liability. So, we've started Hacking it. This is the world of nootropics, or smart drugs, and it's way, way deeper than your morning cup of coffee. This is the gateway drug to biohacking, the first step in deciding that the baseline human experience just isn't good enough. Nootropics are substances that claim to improve cognitive function, memory, creativity, focus, and motivation. They're the attempt to chemically overclock your own gray matter. You've got the synthetics like the Racetam family. Pyrosatum, the granddaddy of smart drugs, was first synthesized in the 1960s. It's believed to work by improving the fluidity of neuronal membranes, essentially making it easier for your brain cells to talk to each other. Users report a subtle but significant increase in clarity, like cleaning a dirty window. Then you have the natural adaptogens, like L-theanine, an amino acid found in green tea. It promotes a state of alert calm by boosting alpha brain waves, the same ones that show up during meditation. It's focus without the jitters. It's the special sauce that makes green tea feel different from a double espresso. But the rabbit hole goes darker. You have executives in Silicon Valley microdosing psilocybin or LSD, claiming it unlocks non-linear thinking and boosts creativity. You have students stacking complex chemical cocktails to pull 72-hour study sessions. This isn't about fixing a problem anymore. It's not about healing the sick. It's about making the healthy better. It's the pursuit of a surplus. The question, the odd why of it all, is what this pursuit costs. If your personality, your drive, and your brilliant ideas are all curated by a daily handful of bills, how much of that success is really you? We're not just hacking our brains to think faster. We're hacking them to be more compliant, more productive, more efficient cogs in the very machine we built. We are chemically tuning our minds to tolerate an intolerable pace. It's the ultimate irony, upgrading our biology just to keep up with our own artificial demands. And if this is what we're willing to do to our software, what happens when we start messing with the hardware itself? Cyborg hack. Tweaking your brain's chemistry is one thing. It's temporary. It washes out. But the next level of biohacking is permanent. It's the moment you decide to physically merge your flesh with a machine. It's the point of no return. It starts innocently enough. Look at your wrist. That fitness tracker or smartwatch? That's biohacking light. It's a wearable, a non-invasive sensor that monitors your heart rate, your sleep, your steps. It collects data. It informs you. But you can take it off. It's still a tool. The true cyborg hack is when the tool becomes an implant. This is the domain of grinders, a subculture of biohackers who believe in augmenting the human body with homemade, open source, or surgical implants. The most common starting point is an NFC or RFID chip, the same kind you have in your credit card or office key fob, injected into the webbing between the thumb and forefinger. With a wave of their hand, they can unlock their front door, log into their computer, or pay for groceries. It sounds like a trivial convenience, but the principle is profound. You are embedding a piece of technology under your skin that makes you machine-readable. But grinders go much, much further. They don't just want convenience, they want new senses. Some implant tiny coated neodymium magnets into their fingertips. Why? To feel magnetic fields. They report being able to sense running microwaves, feel the hum of live wires in a wall, 
or even detect data being written to a hard drive. They have given themselves a sixth sense. Others are experimenting with implanted haptic devices, like the North Sense, a small pierceable device that would vibrate every time the user faced magnetic north, giving them an internal animalistic sense of direction. And this is just the DIY scene. In the medical world, this is already happening. Continuous glucose monitors for diabetics are small sensors implanted just under the skin, beaming real-time blood sugar data to a smartphone. Pacemakers are implants that hack the heart's very rhythm. The line is blurring fast. A phone is a tool you use. An implant is a tool you are. This is the cyborg reality, and it opens a Pandora's box of terrifying new questions. If you can unlock your house with your hand, can someone skim your hand just like a credit card? If your medical implant is connected to the internet, can it be hacked? We're not just talking about data theft, we're talking about someone potentially killing you by pushing a bad firmware update to your heart. We are willingly, eagerly installing permanent, vulnerable back dollars into our own bodies. And why? Because we can. Source code hack. Modifying our hardware with silicon and steel is one thing, it's an add-on, a patch. But the real revolution, the one that makes biohackers look like children playing with toys, is happening at a level we can't even see. It's the hack of our fundamental source code. This is CRISPR-Cas9. CRISPR is a search and replace function for DNA. It's a system found in bacteria, a primitive immune system they use to fight viruses. They store a mugshot of viral DNA in their own genetic code, and a special enzyme called Cas9 acts as a molecular scissor. If that virus ever shows up again, the bacteria sends out the Cas9 enzyme with the mugshot. It searches, finds the matching DNA sequence, and snip! It cuts the virus, neutralizing it. In 2012, scientists figured out how to hijack this system. They realized they could give the Cas9 scissors any mugshot they wanted. They can now send this enzyme into any cell, plant, animal, or human, with instructions to find a specific gene, cut it out, and even paste a new synthetic gene in its place. The potential for good is almost impossible to overstate. We are talking about the end of genetic disease. We could delete sickle cell anemia from a person's bloodline. We could cut out the gene for Huntington's disease. We could edit immune cells to make them hyper-aggressive cancer killers. This is the power to cure suffering on a scale we've never imagined. And that is precisely why it's so terrifying. Because the same tool that can delete Huntington's disease can, in theory, edit for other traits. Why stop at fixing a bug? Why not upgrade? Why not edit for higher muscle density, enhanced intelligence, perfect eyesight, a specific hair or eye color? This is the nightmare of designer babies. This isn't science fiction. In 2018, a Chinese scientist named He Zheng Kui announced he had used CRISPR-Cas9 to edit the embryos of two twin girls attempting to give them immunity to HIV. The global scientific community was horrified, not just because of the ethics, but because of the sheer recklessness. We're talking about germline editing, making changes that are hereditary. He Zhang Kui didn't just edit those two girls, he edited their children, and their children, and their children forever. Here's the problem. We barely understand the genome. It's not a simple blueprint. It's a chaotic, four-billion-year-old plate of spaghetti code full of dormant genes, junk DNA we don't understand, and complex interdependencies. Editing one gene might seem fine, but it could accidentally switch on five others, leading to catastrophic, unforeseen consequences like cancers or immune disorders decades down the line. We have found the source code for life itself, and we've immediately started trying to improve it without an instruction manual, driven by nothing but our own hubris. Pandora's box is wide open, and we have no idea what we've just unleashed. Pause button hack. 
Editing our code is profound, but it still doesn't solve the ultimate biological problem. The one feature that's hardwired into every living thing. Every piece of hardware, organic or not, eventually fails. The system crashes. We call it death. But what if you could hack that? Not by living forever, but by hitting the ultimate pause button. This is the strange, audacious, and deeply morbid world of cryonics. Let's be clear, this is not freezing. If you just freeze a human body, you destroy it. The water inside every single cell expands, turning into jagged ice crystals that shred the cellular structures. It's like flash freezing a tomato. You end up with mush. The process is actually called vitrification. As soon as a person is declared legally dead, a team swoops in. They stabilize the body, circulate the blood with an artificial heart-lung machine, and begin to replace all of it. They pump the body full of a cryoprotectant solution, a cocktail of chemicals that is, for all intents and purposes, a medical-grade antifreeze. This solution doesn't freeze solid. Instead, as it's cooled to minus 196 degrees Celsius, that's minus 321 Fahrenheit, in a vat of liquid nitrogen, it becomes a solid glass-like state without forming any cell-destroying ice crystals. The goal is to pause all molecular decay, to stop time for the body, preserving its structure down to the synapses. The entire industry is based on one single monumental bet that dead is a relative term. They are betting that future technology, perhaps centuries from now, will be advanced enough to do three things. Safely reverse the vitrification process and revive the patient. Have the technology, like swarms of nanobots, to repair all the cellular damage caused by the process and by whatever killed them in the first place. And cure the original cause of death, be it old age, cancer, or a car crash. Cryonics is not a cure, it's an ambulance ride to the future. It is the most expensive, speculative lottery ticket in human history. The odd why here is the sheer audacity. You are placing your faith not just in a hypothetical, godlike future technology, but also in human civilization itself. You're betting that society won't collapse, that the company storing your body won't go bankrupt, that future humans won't just pull the plug or worse, put you in a museum as a relic of a primitive, death-fearing age. And the deepest question, who or what wakes up? If they revive you 500 years from now, are you still you? Or are you a biological antique, a caveman awakening in a world of beings who may have long since hacked themselves into something entirely different? The final hack. But why just pause the game? Why try to preserve the faulty, fragile, meat-based hardware at all? Why not just leave it behind? This is the final hack, the end game, the philosophical and technological vertigo known as transhumanism and its ultimate goal, mind uploading. Transhumanism, or H+, is the belief that the human race can and should evolve beyond its current physical and mental limitations by merging with technology. It sees the human body not as a sacred vessel, but as a transitional phase, a stepping stone. And the final step is to transcend it. This is whole brain emulation. The idea is to take a human brain, scan it with unimaginable precision, slicing it thin, atom by atom, or using advanced non-invasive scanners, and map every single one of its 86 billion neurons and 100 trillion synaptic connections. You then take this map, this connectome, and perfectly recreate it in a digital substrate. You build a virtual model of that exact brain, and then you turn it on. If you've done it correctly, the simulation wakes up. It has every memory, every fear, every joy, every nuance of the original person. It believes it is that person with a perfect continuity of consciousness. Congratulations, you are now code. You are immortal. You live in the cloud. You can copy yourself. You can back yourself up. You can email yourself across the solar system at the speed of light. You can experience any reality you can dream of or download skills in seconds. 
you have achieved digital godhood. Or have you? This is the ship of Theseus Paradox taken to its most terrifying conclusion. The simulation that wakes up thinks it's you, but is it? Or did the original you, your physical brain, your stream of consciousness, simply die and a perfect soulless copy just got switched on? This is the horror of the continuity of consciousness. When you go to sleep and wake up, you trust you're the same person. But in this scenario, you are creating a fork. The original you dies on the scanning table and a digital ghost is born convinced it won the lottery. You haven't upgraded yourself. You've just created a perfect echo and called it an afterlife. And what kind of digital hells could this create? A simulation you can't control? A pause button or an off switch held by a corporation? An eternity of digital torment? Your very consciousness, your soul, could be edited, copied, sold, or deleted by a bad actor. This is the ultimate biohack, the choice to trade our messy, flawed, and finite biology for the cold, perfect, and infinite prison of the machine. From smart drugs to digital ghosts, the thread is the same. The burning human desire to seize control. We are prying open the black box of our own existence, driven by the belief that we can fix it, but we're doing it all without an instruction manual. The question is no longer if we can redefine what it means to be human. The question is what kind of humanity will be left when we're done.